The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Bush, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. St. Louis and I thank you um, for convening this important hearing. Uh, Director Ray, I want to pick up where we left off last week when you testified before the House Judiciary Committee. The FBI's treatment and surveillance of black protesters and its failure to respond to a white supremacist insurrection. So let's start on June 1st, 2020. Protesters were marching for justice in George, uh, for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor outside of the White House in Lafayette Square. That early that evening, law enforcement stormed the stormed the square, firing rubber bullets, tear gas, and other chemical agents into the crowd. Director Ray, did the FBI issue a formal threat assessment during the summer uh, 2020 protest for racial justice? Yes or no? Here right now, I don't remember which intelligence products we put out in the summer. I would say that those individuals who were uh, engaged in crowd control did not include the FBI because that's not that's not our contribution to the effort. We don't we don't do the crowd control piece. That's other agencies. Uh, so there was no formal threat. You, you can't say that about um, January 6th um, either. You're saying that that is not the FBI? No, no. The, there's two different parts of your question. One was the formal threat assessment issue, and the other was your description of uh, you know, tear gas and, and that kind of thing. And what I was saying on the second part, namely tear gas uh, and engagement with protesters in that regard, that's, that's not the FBI's role in place. Right, I'm just, what we just said law enforcement, we don't, I only say law enforcement, I just asked yeah. if there was a formal threat assessment. Right, and so then on the formal threat assessment part of your question, uh, uh, we did not, I know we did not issue what I think most people are describing as a quote unquote formal threat assessment related to January 6th. That is a term that I think is normally used in connection with the so-called NSSE or SEER oh, event. As far okay. as the summer, yes, the as summer. far as the summer, I don't, I just sitting here right now, since I know this is a hearing on January 6th, I just don't remember what products or intelligence assessments we did or didn't do over the course of the summer. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, it's clear to me that the FBI took considerable action against people nonviolently protesting police brutality, which is because police killed black people, yet failed to respond to, un to known, known white supremacist insurrectionists seeking to attack the Capitol and overturn the results of an election. A few hours after law enforcement cleared protesters out of Lafayette Square, a Cessna jet took off from an airport in Manassas, Virginia and flew a seven mile circle around DC. Director Ray, there have been reports that this plane was operated by the FBI and was used to surveil protesters. Is that accurate? Uh, Congressman, I can't say sitting here right now exactly what any specific FBI aviation asset could have been used for. Uh, I will tell you we have very specific policies that govern all that from the Justice Department, mm -hmm. uh, and I have no director. reason to believe those policies weren't complied with. It, as, as the director, that's not something that you um, would know? Well, we have, you may, as you may know, Congressman Moon, every FBI field office has aviation assets and they're used all the time. So I, I, I can't sitting here right now tell you what a particular Cessna may or may not have been used, even if it was ours, which I don't actually know to be the case. So let's talk about what was difficult to assess for your agency and what was treated as unverified intelligence. An online post that included maps of Capitol Tunnel said, Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their Black Lives Matter and Pantifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent. Stop calling this a march or a protest. Go there ready for war. We get our president or we die. Nothing else will achieve this goal. How did the, the First Amendment prevent you from monitoring threats of violence from white supremacist groups ahead of January 6th, but not prevent you from surveillance of people protesting in defense of Black Lives during the summer of 2020? those protests? Well, Congresswoman, first, the Norfolk report, which is the one that you're referring to uh, in your quote, is something that we took seriously and shared immediately with the Capitol Police and our other partners. Second, when it comes to white supremacist violence, which we describe as racially motivated uh, uh, violent extremism, uh, is something that I think we have taken seriously, which is why I said in my opening and reminded the committee that back in July of 2019, I, we elevated that threat to our highest threat priority. And that's why I, we have, have doubled 
doubled the number of investigations into this kind of activity that you're right, describing. And in fact, something that tripled just, the number of arrests, happened. tripled the I'm number of arrests time. in this I'm case. In my time. Yeah. I'm in my time. This is something that just happened that was not addressed. The, gentle, was, the gentlewoman's time has expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it.
via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.